I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. James Wright to Politics and Prose. Dr. Wright is a former history professor and former president of Dartmouth College. He is a champion of veterans affairs. He has visited military, military medical facilities, worked to expand veterans educational opportunities through the Yellow Ribbon Program, and written articles about veterans for online publications. His previous book, Those Who Have Borne the Battle, gives an overview of America's wars from the Revolutionary War to Af Iraq and Afghanistan. His latest book, Enduring Vietnam, is more than just a history of Vietnam. It focuses on the men and women who fought and died in a war with which many Americans still struggle. As a daughter of a Vietnam veteran, I was quite moved by reading Dr. Wright's book, which features accounts of veterans, many of whom are speaking about the war for the first time. Hopefully, reading this book will bring those who did not experience Vietnam one step closer to understanding a war whose impact still continues to affect this nation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. James Wright. Thank you, Katie, and thanks to your dad, uh, Owen Moraine. I was happy to learn that from you tonight. I appreciate your introduction, and it's a treat to be here with you in this very special uh, bookstore and to welcome uh, veterans and uh, friends, including uh, my Dartmouth friends uh, and book lovers generally. This is a very special uh, place, one that contributes so much to the intellectual life of the nation's capital. And I've had the, the privilege of visiting several independent bookstores in the last month in order to talk about this book. And I value so much what places just like this represent and provide. Two weeks ago uh, was Independent Bookstore Day, a day to acknowledge that which we should value every single day of the year. Now, I won't surprise you when I tell you that I enjoy talking about my book. Everyone who comes here enjoys talking about their book and sometimes at great length talking about their book. I hope not to test your patience tonight. I hope you will read it and I hope you will uh, enjoy it. Most importantly, uh, I hope that you'll learn something from it. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time tonight just telling you what this book was about, what I was trying to do when I wrote it. Last year, my wife Susan and I attended a performance of Hamilton in New York. Many of the lines in that play struck me and stayed with me. But I remember as we were walking down the street following the performance, one line kept running through my head. Eliza Hamilton, the widow of Alexander Hamilton, sang along with a chorus of founding fathers, who lives, who dies, who tells your story? Now this is relevant to my remarks because in any war, in any armed confrontation, the first two questions, let's face it, are the determinative ones. Who lives and who dies? Apart from all other descriptions, this is the fundamental question. This is the, the tragic consequence. Indeed, it's not just a, a consequence. We must never forget that, that killing or being killed is finally the cruel purpose of war. That's why I've had so much trouble in recent years with the boots on the ground metaphor that some politicians and pundits have used. I keep reminding that we're not talking about shoe leather. <laughs> we're talking about young people who serve. And we're asking of them, as we put their boots on the ground, who lives and who dies. But then the burden the burden that continues after all of the shooting stops is the lingering question, who tells your story? And I think that shared narrative of battles and wars fought, of those uh, who served, 
and those who sacrificed. This is critical for the framing of the story. We need to fill in that story. The story provides an account of a life lost. It reminds us of who this was and it marks forever the lives of those survivors who knew them, those survivors who carry the memories with them, those survivors who are with them and carry their own experiences with them. We need to assist, each of us needs to assist in the responsibility of carrying these stories and of making certain that these become embedded in our national narrative. This is an important part of what I've tried to do in this book. I've tried to remind readers of the human face of war. I've tried to remind of the human cost of war. I interviewed 160 people for this book. I've called them my collaborators. I sent each of them uh, a month or so ago a personally inscribed copy of the book. They shared with me many personal stories, powerful stories, largely of their own combat experiences, and they affirm my belief that in so many cruel and perverse ways, and this is difficult to get your arms around, but in so many cruel and perverse ways, there may be nothing more human than being in war, than being in combat. There may be no place that tests more directly, more powerfully, who we are. It tests our values. It tests our courage. It tests so many things about us. I also interviewed a number of family members who received the news that their loved one was not coming home. One of these stories sticks with me always. I think of it often. It came from somebody I spent some time talking to and went back and forth with on email. He was 14 or 15, and he was home alone in a small town in Pennsylvania. And there was a knock on the door, and he went to the door, and there were two soldiers standing there in uniform. And they asked him if his parents were home. And he said, no, they, they were not. But they just called, and they should be there in 15 minutes or so. And he very politely asked them if they'd like to wait. And they said they would just sit on the porch and wait for his parents. So he told me he joined them on the porch. And he was very excited to see these two soldiers there. And he said, I have a brother that's in the Army. My brother's in Vietnam. He's going to be home in a couple of months. I can't wait to see him. He's my hero. He flies helicopters. I'm so proud of him. His parents came home, and of course, they learned that this young man's brother would not be coming home. He had said to them, he said, do you know my brother? Do you know my brother? And they didn't answer him. He ran up in the woods, he told me, and just wept and wept and wept after he learned that his brother would not be coming home. Now, this book does provide a history of the war. I am a historian, and I think it's terribly important to set context and to frame the world of the Vietnam generation, but this book really is about a generation. I have to say I'm not very kind to those who sent them off to war. Our nation's leadership failed. They seldom shared their own genuine doubts about what they were doing and what the result might be. They allowed <coughs> politics too often and indeed their own egos too often to dominate. And candor and honesty were frequently set aside in terms of promises and assurances. But in this book, I'm less interested in, in critiquing the nation's leaders than I am in assessing the view of the world that they stressed and shared. <coughs> 
the view of the world that the baby boomer generation learned. The baby boomers, those of you who grew up in the 1950s, remember it was a world of expanding opportunity. You were told so often that you could do so many things, but you also were constantly reminded of doomsday potentially just around the corner. Some of us will remember the duck and cover drills in schools where we really were preparing for what many people assume would be in an inevitable attack by Russian bombers. The baby boomers grew up in a world in which John Kennedy could remind them of obligation. At his inauguration in January of 1961, recall, he exhorted, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Now I have to say, if this, this sense of shared responsibility for the well-being of the Republic seems quaint in 2017, it was not so quaint in 1961. President Kennedy's generation, the baby boomers' parents' generation, they talked on that January day down at the capital of taking on the torch of liberty that have been passed now to their generation. I think the cruel irony of that was that within a few, few years, they had passed that torch of liberty onto the next generation, onto their children. There was a, a great strategic view of that post-war world, and it's ironic that it would play out of all places in the jungles of Vietnam. Vietnam was just a piece and a far larger global contest where we were convinced we had to somehow demonstrate that we could stand up and make a, make a case, make a strong case to protect democracy, even if it meant exaggerating the extent of democracy in South Vietnam. One of my favorite stories of the early years of that war was from Colin Powell. He went out in January of 1963. He was an advisor, a young army officer who was uh, an advisor. And that's, uh, we just had, quote, advisors in there until 1965, till March of 1965. Colin Powell was sent up to a South Vietnamese Army and Arvin base camp near the Oshaw Valley, and the Oshaw Valley is in a distant corner of South Vietnam, up near the uh, demilitarized zone, not too far from south of, of Khe Son, uh, up on the border with Laos. It uh, continues to be a desolate place, and it surely was in 1963. And when Colin Powell was given his orientation there by the Vietnamese uh, commander, he asked him what he thought was an obvious question, what is the purpose of this outpost? And the Vietnamese commander said, the purpose of this outpost is to protect the airstrip down below. And there was a relatively small grass airstrip down below, and that made sense to protect an airstrip. But then Colin Powell said, but what's the purpose of the airstrip? And the Vietnamese commander said, well, the airstrip is there to supply this outpost. <laughs> and Colin Powell would say, he did another tour of Vietnam at a time of heavy combat several years later, but it, he never heard an explanation of some of the tactical decisions and some of the postings in the back country that made a lot more sense than this one he first heard in 1963, the circular logic of that war. In 1965, when the American ground war began, 
Lyndon Johnson sent Marines into Da Nang in March of 1965, and the Army units came in very quickly behind them. But at that time, the dominant public image of those serving in Vietnam was of young heroes fighting communists, communists someplace in the jungles of Southeast Asia. Within a few years, though, as, as American casualties increased significantly, as the war seemed to be going on, as, as the draft picked up, as stories came back about Vietnamese civilians dying, many of them, many Americans came to consider the kids out there as objects of sympathy fighting a cruel and an ill-advised war. Their protests then in 1967, 68, were directed at the nation's leaders. We'll remember the chant, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? After the story of My Lai became public in late 1969, in the minds of some, the kids out there became not objects of sympathy, but instead the perpetrators of that cruel war. Drug-addled psychotics. Of course, by then, LBJ was back home on his ranch in Texas. And now the soldiers serving in Vietnam became the, quote, baby killers. It became in the 1970s and when the war was, was over and in and, and the retrospect, sort of the apocalypse now war. I have described, I do describe here that, that movie as Vietnam meets Woodstock. It may be a good movie. It's not a story of the Vietnam experience. Now I have to say a few weeks ago I made that basic comment uh, to an audience out in Burbank, California, and the first hand raised uh, after I finished my comments was somebody saying, I was a screenwriter on that movie and we tried very hard to make it accurate and it was accurate. <laughs> I chose not to debate him <laughs> on that. I would say that with notable exceptions, especially novels by Vietnam veterans, Tim O'Brien and Carmel Antes and Jim Webb, in very few, few of the popular accounts of the Vietnam War were those who served recognized for what it was they were. These were scared kids. Scared kids who had signed up for a difficult and a very scary assignment. I think it's a tragedy that more people knew the name of Lieutenant William Kelly who led the unit that massacred the civilians at My Lai than knew any of the others who fought in Vietnam. I can assure you there was heroism in Vietnam. Tremendous heroism. But if you think back, there were no publicly embraced heroes. Now it's hard perhaps to, to provide thrilling, heroic, dramatic, wartime accounts for a war that was itself not embraced. But I would argue that, that service, I would argue that heroism is even more compelling than exactly such a war. I just share with you my dedication to this book, which summarizes my view on this. This book is dedicated to that American generation who honorably served in the Vietnam War. And this book salutes those who sacrificed. Their stories deserve to be known and their lives remembered. The difficulty of this American generation's war and the controversies it engendered made their willingness to serve and the sacrifices that they made the greater and not the lesser. In my book, I, I quote from a poem shared with me by a sailor who had been serving on a patrol boat, a swift boat down the Mekong Delta. In April of 1969, uh, he had watched uh, a close friend of his die when their boat was ambushed by enemy troops on a narrow waterway of the Delta. This sailor had gone to Saigon a month later, 
on a brief R&R. And he described sitting there in his hotel room, looking out the window and watching a storm come onto the city. He wrote in his diary, the sky is black now, illuminated now and then by silent strobes of lightning, people hustling about before the storm and before the curfew. But soon the rains will come and cool us all and slow the motion. And the city will become quiet under the soothing rhythm of the rain. People will move inside and watch the monsoon downpour from a darkened window. And some perhaps will reflect on the day just ended. Steve Hayes uh, shared his diary with me where he wrote this. I believe Steve is here tonight and I want to thank him for doing that. Thank you, Steve. That line, some perhaps will reflect on the day just ended. It's long past time for this. But telling the story is a burden that we share. I'd like to just take a few minutes to share with you my effort to reflect on the days of that war, now ended for many years, to reflect upon the very human experience of the Americans who served in Vietnam. In my interviews, I found some compelling stories of those on the ground, and I tried to introduce some of those who died on that ground. A great interview with Don Sullivan from Weymouth, Mass. He graduated from BC and got his draft orders and wasn't sure what he was going to do, went down to talk to the recruiting sergeant and the said, guy said, well, with a college degree, you could become an officer. And he said, why would I want to do that? I'd have to serve a couple of more years. And the sergeant said, I'll tell you why. You can either be sitting inside the officer's club drinking a cold martini, or you can be outside walking guard duty for those who are in there drinking a cold martini. How would you rather spend your time? <laughs> Sullivan decided he would become an officer. <coughs> I don't know if he ever had a cold martini in Vietnam. I know he had some warm beer when he was over there. And he also went into Hamburger Hill on that first day on May 10th, 1969. One of the long, extended, difficult battles of that war. And I tell the story of Hamburger Hill in this book. But he told me, Don Sullivan told me the story of a young man in his unit from the Twin Cities, Buck Dufresne. Buck was a sergeant in his unit, and everybody loved Buck Dufresne. He was a natural leader. It was on the fourth or fifth day when they were told to go up the hill again that they received some enemy rocket fire, and one of the men in the platoon was badly wounded. So Buck Dufresne uh, organized a, a litter group to carry them down on Hamburger Hill. The hill was steep, there was so much fire, they had to carry them down to an area where a medevac helicopter could come in to, to bring them out. And just as they set off, they got another rocket attack, and the young man in the litter died, two other men carrying the litter died, and Buck Dufresne was badly wounded. Don Sullivan assured him he was going to be okay. He said, I'll get you out of here. We're going to get you down at the bottom, Buck. Don't worry. And Buck Dufresne said, no, I'm, I'm looking over Jordan, and there's a band of angels coming after me. And he said, no, there are no band of angels. We're going to get you down to the helicopter. And so they organized another litter group to carry him down. And while they're carrying him down, Buck Dufresne started singing, swing low, sweet chariot coming for to carry me home. I talked to three men who were there that day, and they talked about the power of his voice, singing those lines, and how they'll remember them for all of their lives. Buck Dufresne's life ended, as he predicted, before he reached the bottom of the hill. On the eighth or ninth day, Sullivan tried to organize the group to go up again 
and his men basically mutinied. They said, no, we've already lost half of our unit, for God's sake. We can't do this again. And he, he had no idea what to do. They hadn't trained me, he said, in OCS, what to do if your men mutiny in the field. And another officer said, what the hell are you going to do, threaten to send them to Vietnam? You don't have much <laughs> choice. <laughs> So Don Sullivan picked up his weapon and his equipment and started walking over toward the trail and one of the men said, what the hell are you doing, Lieutenant? And he said, I was told to go up the hill and I'm going. And they said, oh, for God's sakes, we can't let you go up there alone. Wait up, we'll go with you. And just then, the North Vietnamese from on top uh, hit them with uh, another mortar attack. It didn't hit any of the men, but it hit over where their equipment was on the edge of the clearing. And they ran over to check out their equipment, and one man picked up his pack, and it was soaking wet. He had been carrying a can of fruit cocktail for the eight days that he'd been climbing that hill. And those of us who remember sea ration fruit cocktail know how sweet that juice was. And he was intending to drink the juice out of that can when he reached the top. But the shrapnel from the round had shattered the can and all of the juice had leaked out. And he said, God damn it, let's go get them. <laughs> and Sullivan said, well, if it took a shredded fruit cocktail can to motivate the men to go up again, I guess we'll take anything and we would go up again. <laughs> Sullivan came down, it was at Eagle Beach, and he got a letter from his mother back in Massachusetts saying, Donald, I understand that your unit has been engaged in some fighting in an awful sounding place in Vietnam. I surely hope that you've had more, than, more sense than to go up that hill with them. <laughs> some stories from the jacket of the book. On front is this horse foss picture cut off at the, at the eyes. This is Larry Wayne Chaffin. He was 19 years old from St. Louis when horse foss took this photograph in 1965. He did come home from Vietnam, but he had tremendous difficulty adjusting, and he died in 1985 of diabetes. His family always thought it was due to his contact with Agent Orange when he was in Vietnam. On the back, I asked him to include some pictures of some of the people that I talk about. In the middle is Sharon Lane, an Army nurse, one of eight nurses killed in Vietnam just six weeks after arriving there. The only one, the only nurse that was killed in a direct enemy attack, she was from Canton, Ohio. She served at the 312th Evacuation Hospital at Chulai. And in that six weeks, she had spent most of her free time looking after Vietnamese in the nearby villages, extending medical help to them. She was killed in a rocket attack, and I did interview some who were with her and the army nurse who said Vietnam was never the same for her after Sharon Lane was killed. Lenny Hickson is this young man back here in a high school graduation picture in civilian clothes. He was one of a set of triplets born on the Navajo <coughs> reservation. After he graduated from Window Rock High School, Lenny joined the army. He was a paratrooper, a machine gunner, and he was recognized by his buddies for his generosity and his strength. <coughs> he carried their loads when they needed help. He sacrificed his sleep to look after them. Lenny Hickson also died on Hamburger Hill. One of his buddies, and those who served in Vietnam know that a buddy is something that's far different from a friend. People may not know that much about the personal life of their buddies, but there was a relationship that developed between those who served in combat together that went beyond simply growing up in the same neighborhood. And this buddy wrote to Lenny's parents, what a privilege to have known such a man. Lenny Hickson was buried at Fort Defiance Cemetery on the Navajo Reservation. And following a Catholic funeral there, the Navajo elders performed their ceremony for this young warrior. One of his triplet sisters threw herself on the coffin and begged to be buried with her brother. Jimmy Hickey from Quincy, Massachusetts. Bernie Edelman just gave me the booklet from a gathering of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial 
in Quincy. Jimmy Hickey was part of a Irish Marine culture in Quincy, Massachusetts. He was going to join the Army with some of his buddies when he was a high school junior. He was just 17 years old. He delayed going in with them. His parents pushed back a little bit and he had a girlfriend that said, don't go, stay here, and so he stayed. But the following winter, this February of 1968, during Tet, one of that original group that had joined the Marines, one of Jimmy Hickey's dear friends was killed in Vietnam. So Jimmy and four others dropped out of school a month before graduation from Quincy High School and they joined the Marines. He was in Vietnam by early 1969 and he died in May. He was on Hill 55, northeast of Liberty Bridge. This was an area that the Marines called Dodge City. There's a square in Quincy that's named in honor of Jimmy Hickey. And at last count, Bernie, there were 19 other squares in that city remembering young men who died in Vietnam. Jimmy Hickey's uncle, Phil Burns, described by the family as a very sentimental Irish American, he wrote a poem called The Magic Horse that the family shared with me and that I print in the book. When Jimmy Hickey was a young kid, he insisted that he had a magic horse that nobody else could see. He tied the horse up by his bed at night. He said it protected him and it took him to wonderful places. Mr. Burns wrote his poem about Jimmy's horse and it ended with the line, Dear Jim, I'll lead you home upon your magic horse. The poem evokes Peter, Paul, and Mary's song, Puff the Magic Dragon. Dragons live forever, but not so little boys. Also on the back of the jacket is somebody that I knew, Michael Lydon. I grew up in Galena, Illinois. Galena is the Latin word for lead sulfide. It's an old lead mining town. After I got out of the Marines, I worked in the mines for a while. My boss there was Clarence Lydon, a World War II Army veteran with a Purple Heart. And I got to know his son, Michael. And Michael died on Hamburger Hill when a rocket-propelled grenade struck him in the chest and killed him immediately on the 14th of May, 1969. When I was over to Vietnam, visiting the places that I was writing about, I arranged to go with a, a guide, a former, an army veteran of the Vietnam War, and two Vietnamese, one a driver, the other interpreter and guide, and we set out, I wanted to go to the back country, I wanted to go through i Corps. I wanted to go up in the highlands, I wanted to see those places where the worst fighting took place. And I wanted to climb Hamburger Hill. <coughs> Dong Ap Bia. I met with, in the nearby village of Alawi that morning with two North Vietnamese veterans of that war that had fought against the Americans there, and we talked, and it was hard to get a lot out of them, but I asked them if they would join me climbing the hill, and they did. And we got to the top of the hill. I wondered what I was doing, trying to climb to the top of that hill. I wondered how the kids had done it in 1969. The fact that they were over 50 years younger than me was not a sufficient explanation. <laughs> Nobody was shooting down at me and I wasn't carrying 50, 60, 70 pounds of equipment when I was trying to go. But the trails were still hot and humid and slippery. It was a difficult climb. And we sat on top and I told the North Vietnamese veterans about Michael Lydon, and I pulled out of my pocket a piece of lead sulfide of galena that I'd picked up in the Graham mine when I'd worked there many years before, and I kept on my desk. And I told them what it was. I told them about Michael Lydon, and I said, I want to bury this hill, this here on top of the hill. I said, I can assure you this lead sulfide, this galena, 
will last as long as the red clay lasts on top of the hill. And I left it there. I spoke on Veterans Day 2009. It was quite an honor for me when I was asked to speak at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial on that day. I was very moved by it. I was standing in front of the wall on a cool rainy day with gold star mothers sitting right in front of me and surrounded by veterans who had come to remember and to salute again. Many of them had come on their motorcycles. I concluded my remarks that day with a reminder, and I, 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 I mention it now because I think it continues to frame my engagement and my objective in writing this book. I said casualties of war cry out to be known as persons, not as abstractions called casualties, nor as numbers entered into the books, and not only as names chiseled into marble or granite. We need to ensure that here in this place of memory, lives as well as names are recorded lives with smiling human faces, remarkable accomplishments, engaging personalities, and with dreams to pursue. We do this for them, for history, and for those in the future who will send the young to war. In many ways, trying to remember and remind about these lives has been an important part of what I've been doing for the last several years. In the play Hamilton, which I reference at the outset of these comments, George Washington, the old soldier, sang a chorus along with Eliza Hamilton. George Washington sang, let me tell you what I wish I'd known when I was young and dreamed of glory. You have no control. Who lives? Who dies? Who tells your story? And my book represents my attempt to contribute to the effort, to the obligation to make certain that the stories are told. I hope that someday in the future, even more people can answer affirmatively if asked the question, do you know my brother? An email I received recently said, thank you for writing the words that many of us combat veterans cannot speak. I replied that it is hard, but we all have to encourage these veterans to speak. So my regards to all of the veterans here, thank you for your service, thank you for your sacrifice, and all of us, veterans and non-veterans, need to join to tell the stories. And if we don't have stories to tell, we have to listen to the stories. And if we listen to the stories, we have to learn from them. Recording them is important, but it's not sufficient. Eulogy is not enough. Thanking someone for their service is not adequate. We need to listen. We need to hear. And most importantly, we need to learn the lessons of these stories. Thank you very much. I think Katie gave you the ground rules for the questions, and you heard it. You're right on top, sir. Thank you for your uh, amazing talk. Uh, you're a great speaker. <laughs> um, two quick questions. One is a speculation question, a what-if question. What if John Kennedy had not been assassinated? Could you speculate about whether the war would have gone the direction it did? And my second question is, what kind of combination question, what is the predominant feeling of the soldiers that survived Vietnam looking back? Is it anger? Is it sadness? And, and how did writing this book change you? That's an yeah, interesting set of questions. I'm not a, you know, a Kennedy scholar in this book. I certainly talk about 
uh, this very question. Uh, some people, uh, certainly uh, the, the, the Kennedy supporters and apologists insist that uh, had he lived, uh, he never would have uh, got us involved in Vietnam. And in, in November of 1963, he had started to talk about to somebody about let's let's take a look and see if there is an exit strategy. Uh, he also uh, announced that there was going to be a drawing down of a thousand troops, but that was symbolic to show their support for the new government in, in Vietnam. He said he couldn't do anything till after the election, and it's that that that, that I keep thinking of. John Kennedy was a very savvy politician. I'm not sure he would have wanted to be known any more than any politician of that era would have wanted to be known as the man who lost Vietnam. Mm -hmm. I think he would have been very, very concerned about that. I also think, though, that, the, that Kennedy had made it pretty clear that he, he did not support sending in ground troops. He had escalated significantly the number of advisors that were there. He put them in uniform. He expanded significantly what they were allowed to do. He increased the stakes quite a bit. I don't know if he would have changed his mind and sent in uh, ground troops. In terms of those who've served in Vietnam and came back and that, that, that I've interviewed and those that I've known and, and, and talked to, I think that there, that there is obviously, and, and many of you here could speak to that better than I, some residual bitterness, certainly some residual sadness. But I think part of it also relates to the fact that, that, that nobody ever wanted to even acknowledge who they were and what they had done. Uh, they uh, came home and nobody asked them. I remember this powerful story of an army nurse who came home. She'd just seen so much terrible stuff as a nurse. And her hometown and parish held a potluck for her. And she, and she said she was just absolutely broken when she realized that they'd gone through that evening and nobody asked her about Vietnam. One kid that came back, and I call all of you who are their kids, one kid who came back said, you'd, you'd think I'd just been to Florida, you know, a nice tan, <laughs> uh, but your hair is shorter than it used to be. And, and I think that it was is that as much as anything, a sense in the, in, in the organizations, uh, the VA at that time, really run by World War II, uh, veterans, uh, not sympathetic to the Vietnam veterans, thought they were a bunch of whiners and drug addicts and all sorts of other things. They had to deal with that. Uh, the VFW they did, obviously they run the VFW, uh, would come to do, to do that, to exercise leadership there. And they've been far more accommodating in that organization, I think, to the Iraq and Afghanistan veterans than the World War II veterans were to them. Uh, I can't remember, was that your third? How does the writing of this book change you, if at all? I think it changed me just to, to recognize the complexity of, of generalizing uh, about war. I'm a historian, and historians work to develop generalization, but there are so many moving parts of this. There's so many human faces. There's so many human experiences. It's very hard to do that, and, and people do talk about uh, Vietnam as a mistake, and I'm certainly willing to, to, to sign on to that, but I'd like to know a little bit more about what it is that they mean when they say it's a mistake, because people on every end of the political spectrum say that, and they figure that that concludes their argument, that they don't need to say any more. <laughs> and as some of the Vietnam War veterans have said, how would you like to have served for a mistake? How, how would you like to have watched a friend die for a mistake? I, I don't know that the, 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 the and, That's you know, what John Kerry said to the Senate. He said, Pardon? no one wants to be the last man to die for a mistake. John Kerry, yes, who did. served yes, and was decorated. He was decorated before he said that. <laughs> yes. So you had a question as yes. well? Yes. Yes. Um, this is my generation. I graduated from college in 1969. My late husband, um, who was from Quincy, um, was an uh, anti-war activist. Um, reading these stories, didn't our leadership make you sick that these men were sent on a fruitless mission? Apparently, um, it was well known that the South Vietnamese government would not stand at all. It had no support and that as soon as we left, it would collapse. And that Richard Nixon 
I mean, now we know. Sabotage the peace talks. He sent, um, I don't remember her, her name. Chenault. Yes. Chenault. Yes, Madam Chenault uh, to uh, President Tu and said, hang on, you will do better with Richard Nixon. I, I, people I, died for that. The kinds of people that you talk about. The peace movement wasn't about uh, looking down on them. It was about bringing them home before any more died. Yeah, I, I, as I said, I'm not very kind to any of the leadership in this book, uh, from, from uh, Eisenhower uh, to Nixon. Uh, but uh, that's not my purpose in writing this book. Uh, there are other people who can debate that and, and do it, argue it uh, very well, and I think that most of the debate would, would go in the direction where you are. Uh, very few people will make a strong and persuasive case. Some will, that's saying that they, they did the right thing. But my, my point is, when all of this is going on, what about these kids? Who were they? Who no, I understand. I had friends who went. I had friends who protested. Yeah. Um, and if we hadn't protested, we'd still be there. <laughs> Ironically, Kerry was swift boated too later he on was, after yeah. he was wounded, what, three times? Yeah. Um, did the soldiers discuss or, or talk about policy, politics, whether they thought? It was good the U.S. was in, it was bad, or they're just too busy surviving, trying to stay alive? I think many people said they had views on the war when they went over there. Probably, uh, certainly in the early years when they went over there, they thought we were doing the right thing. They thought, you know, if we don't fight them here, we'll have to fight them in the streets of Los Angeles. I think probably pretty uniformly, all of the people that I talked to said we did not talk very much about this in Vietnam. We did not talk about the politics, and you know they they didn't think oh, well, we've got to win this battle, or they'll be in Los Angeles yeah. next week. Uh, it was really about uh, meeting their duties in the field. It was about uh, protecting themselves. It was about looking after their buddies. About not doing anything that would embarrass or compromise their unit. It was a, it was a very personal experience, and I think if you talk to veterans, combat veterans in any war not just Vietnam, they would say the same thing. World War II veterans. Didn't many of them come home, though, against the war? There was organizations? The, I, I think that, that most of the people that I talked to, and, and, and again, you have to realize when you interview people 40, 50 years after, after the case that, that uh, you know, some things may have evolved, but uh, I would say that, that most people that I interviewed, within a week or so of being in country, they, they began to realize a few things. They began to think the South Vietnamese really don't want us here. Mm -hmm. They don't like us. They're afraid of us. Uh, and they also uh, had a real uh, hostility that developed toward uh, the Arvin, toward the South Vietnamese soldiers. They thought that, why are we fighting? And they're not, because they were not as engaged as much. And that part of that was a, was a <coughs> decision made at MACV. Uh, that we had to carry on the war uh, in the out country uh, because we could do it more effectively. And so we, we pushed them to the side, and I think there was this real resentment that they were not uh, suffering and sacrificing the way that we were, and so Americans wondered why they were there. And, and I think probably by the time that most of the guys that I spoke to came home, they had pretty negative views toward the war. Most of them didn't com did not come home and engage in anti-war activities, though. They, they, they were quiet. They went about their lives. They didn't necessarily like the anti-war protesters. Part of that was because they thought the protesters had uh, really been very hostile to them uh, and did not like them, and so they just did not want to get uh, involved in that. And, and uh, some of them did. The Vietnam Veterans Against the War was, I think, a very powerful organization, but it was really just a small <coughs> slice of those who served there who were actively involved with it. Thank you. Yes. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, Dartmouth class of 64, Marine Corps 64 to 68, Vietnam, May 66, January 68. That's a I start. think this is the first nonfiction book that I've read about Vietnam, with the exception of John Hur's Dispatches. And I want to just congratulate you for a fantastic job. The way that you have taken the people whom you've interviewed and had them tell the story of their own experiences and their own emotions, I think adds not just to the Vietnam experience, but to the history of men and now women who fight 
and how they feel about that. As I read the book, I felt so many of the things that I had felt either while I was in Vietnam or afterward. But I want to, I want to, I do have a question. I, I want to talk about two of them in particular because of how I think you really captured somebody. The first is the sense of guilt, and you caught it in two ways. You talked, and I think it was Sullivan after he came down to Red Beach after, after Hamburger Hill, who said he felt guilty for surviving. I felt guilty when I went home in January of 1968 yeah. when Tet happened and I had left a company behind of men who were under my command and they were going to have to be in combat and I was the lucky one I got to go home. You also spoke in an indirect way about the guilt that people feel if they had only done something different to save a friend's life or to prevent a friend from being wounded and anybody particularly in command has that feeling that always goes with them afterward. But to add a lighter note, I had totally forgotten about the 55-gallon drums and the excrement <laughs> being burned in them and the smell uh, of that. My question is, how did you go about finding all of these people whom you interviewed and have them speak and then knit it together in a story about the combat experience that normally only fiction writers capture when they write fiction about their wartime experience? Well, I, I worked actually with the Vietnam Veterans of America. Bernie Edelman uh, helped me with that organization and the VFW. And I asked them to get the word out on their sites, their magazine, what I was trying to do. And what I was trying to do was really talk to people who had served with men or women who were killed in Vietnam, because I was really wanting to focus on, on that. So. As, as you as you know, in reading the book, there there is a bias here. Uh, about 25 percent of the those who served in Vietnam were actually in combat units. They're the guys that I talked to. It's the, they're the guys, and I also talked to people in in, in medical, in the you know, the corpsmen, uh, the medics, the nurses, and the doctors. I also talked to them, and and the graves registration people. And and so the, there is a bias, and that I I really have the the grunts out on the ground that I interviewed. Uh, and the fact that I was interested in writing about some kids who didn't come home, many of them said to me, I, I, I haven't really talked about this, but I, I would talk to you about it because I, I would love to have somebody tell Jimmy Hickey's story or tell mm. some other story. And I think that that was a terribly important. And then, then you end up sort of in this day of the Internet, somebody says, hey, you might want to talk to this guy. And so I, I would never claim this is a random sample. It's not. It's sort of, it, 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 it's networks, it's other things, but I put together, I think, a pretty good cross-section of kids who served in combat units. Thank you. I'm, uh, I didn't serve. I'm the son of a World War II veteran and the son-in-law of another World War II veteran, and I was a student at Dartmouth uh, at the time, in fact, I th I'm old enough to remember you as Professor Wright, if, <laughs> as opposed to President Wright. But um, time has passed, over you know, 40, 45 years since most people who served have served, and sometimes many more years than that. From the people you talked to, what, was there a, an epiphany or a change or an inflection point where either they came to a sense of peace is probably the wrong term, but, but, but sort of acknowledgment of their time and, and a place of contentment, or was it just the passage of time? Are there any generalities you can draw, or was it really, because really, they didn't get the parades, and they didn't get the welcome, and they didn't get the, the bumper stickers and the yellow ribbons. So w has there been anything that's at least helped bring them to a point of sensing that they're accepted, or is, or is that not the case? I think that, that you know, again, I'm not sure I ever asked anyone that question, do, do, when did you think you were accepted or do you think you're accepted? I think that some probably uh, think they're still not accepted. I think that they're probably in a minority. Let's face it, the Vietnam generation has gone on to do some remarkable things mm -hmm. in every, every part of our society. They've contributed significantly to this country in the years since uh, Vietnam. Uh, I, I think that the wall, the, the dedication of the wall in 1982 was uh, terribly important, but uh, there was a sense uh, that they had done this on their own. And some of them held back a while uh, before going there. Emotionally, they weren't ready. Uh, 
others had heard some bad stories about it because of the, the negative publicity about the wall a mile in and what it represented. But I think uh, uniformly Vietnam veterans uh, uh, who have lost friends have gone back there. And, and one of the, the little sidelights about my, my comment about the buddy and the meaning of buddy in combat, a couple people said that they, they just knelt down and started weeping because they realized they couldn't remember the last name of somebody that they only knew as horse or, or, or Fred or Tex or something else. It was just sort of relationship where they, they did not get into, you know, so where are you from uh, that much. But uh, I think that the wall was important. I think that we've, you know, the country has reached out. I think that the President Reagan uh, did a good job. Carter had started, Reagan did a good job, I think, reaching out and trying to re-embrace the veterans, but it took a while. And uh, some would say that maybe they still don't feel. I mean, some of them still say, you know, you know, somebody saying to me, thank you for your service, about as meaningless as somebody saying, God bless you if I sneeze. He said, doesn't, you know, they don't mean it anymore than they really think God's gonna bless me and they really are not thanking me for my service. Now, I don't know if any, everyone quite thinks that way. But. Hi, President Wright. Uh, you've also spent time in recent years with a lot of young Americans who served in Iraq and Afghanistan. Can you talk about some of the differences and the similarities you see with their experiences compared to Vietnam veterans? Yeah, this, this is just a, a different sort of military force today. Everybody knows that. It's, it's, it's far more professional. Everyone is a volunteer. They tend to be older. Uh, they, they tend to stay in, many of them uh, longer. Uh, I think uh, the, the Center for New American Security had a report that just came out today so talking about the concern about uh, the fact that, uh, that, that, that we are developing sort of a, a military subset of our population because many of them are the children of veterans. And I do think that there's a real problem here. The Vietnam veterans were, were you know, the, the, there is a, certainly a recognition that, that they were you know, more blue collar uh, because of the, the uh, college exemption deferment, rather, and other things. But uh, it, it represented a pretty good cross-section of society serving, not necessarily in combat. I think that's where it really got very blue-collar, but again, not exclusively so, and not just among officers in combat. There were, there were kids who graduated from college who were in combat units. How do they view their service, though? What, do you, what are some of the differences? Today? I think that, uh, that they're proud of it. I'm not sure that, that most Americans have any more understanding of what it is that we're asking them to do than most Americans had any understanding of what it is that we asked the kids in Vietnam to do. Uh, there was more reporting then, but uh, you know, we're really talking about in both, uh, both instances very small unit operations, uh, small conflicts, uh, uh, explosives and IEDs. We're not talking about any grand battles with few exceptions. We're not talking about sweeping across the plains of Western France to, to liberate Paris. We're not talking about raising a flag on Mount Suribachi on Iwo Jima. It's just a, it's a, these have been different worlds. And I think that the, 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 the stories don't get told because they, they're, they're small slices. But uh, for those who have served in Vietnam and certainly today in the wars know that these small slices are every bit as harrowing, as human, as cruel, as difficult as uh, what their grandfathers may have uh, uh, had in World War II. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, I guess this is our uh, last one. Where, yes, sir. Uh, would you share your thoughts about Robert McNamara? <laughs> Again, my, my purpose in this book was not to, to, to try to analyze and, and get into that debate. I'm not very kind to him either. I think that he, uh, he was at times deceitful uh, he was uh, more times, I think, uh, supremely self-confident that he knew what he was doing. I think he ignored uh, the military, and the military, I think, played into that. Uh, General McMaster wrote a book describing how the military didn't stand up enough and tell the truth uh, to the administration about what they would need to accomplish what they had in Vietnam. But I think that, that McNamara was uh, very much, uh, along with uh, Johnson, a, a, a key player and deciding, don't worry, we can get this done. And, uh, you know, Johnson said at one, one, one time, uh, you know, coldly, you know, I think we can do it and, and certainly we have fewer, fewer casualties than in Korea. Well, there were 35,000 kids killed in Korea. And if, if, if fewer would have been okay, uh, that's uh, very troubling. Obviously, it was a lot more uh, 
than the 35,000 that were killed in Korea. I don't have high regard, but, but McNamara at least, he lived long enough, uh, which some of the others didn't, and, and he also kind of acknowledged that it was uh, a mistake, but uh, it was, uh, I'm not sure that most veterans uh, accept his explanation for that. Thank you. Thank you.